very big hello to my friends, students, postgraduate scholars, researchers, fellowship students of laparoscopic and minimal access surgery. You know, we have been uh, a long way through the journey into laparoscopy. And if you remember, in my last lecture, we visited the endoscopic anatomy of inguinal hernias. The agenda of today's lecture is that we demonstrate the technical aspects of the laparoscopic management of inguinal hernias. But before I go into that, you all are aware about the fact that around 1880s or 1885-87 at that area era, what happened, the inguinal hernias were started getting repaired by the open technique. And I think we ought salute the father of open herniography, Adardo Bassini, who is the pioneer of open hernia repair. And then we went to different techniques and then came a technique we call as the shoulders repair. The shoulders repair is a four layered repair which took a very good repute for uh, some amount of time. And you will be, you know, surprised to know that even at this time in Canada, 25% of these repairs are done by shoulders four layer technique. But as the time grew, because every other day is a new beginning in surgery, what happened that we started getting into a technique called as a tension-free repairs. So then came the Lichtenstein repair in around 1989. And Lichtenstein repair is a gold standard because the idea was the introduction of mesh. Thanks to Usher who introduced this concept that meshes create the tension-free repairs. So the biological tissue repairs went back into, went into a new era of mesh herniaplasty and Lichtenstein, as of now also today, achieves a good amount of acceptance in the surgical repairs of the hernias. And friends, as you are aware, as you are aware about the fact that two, two techniques were born, the one we call as the tap technique and the other we call as the tap technique. They are both endoscopic or you can say laparoscopic procedures. Generally, I should say that tap achieves a better uh, you know, um, reputation and uh, is a better procedure than TAP. But there is there are plus and minus and good and bad things on either side. So TAP is for bigger hernias, difficult hernias, maybe irreducible hernias, uh, sliding hernias. And if you want to, you know, uh, check out whether the other side has a hernia, it's for uh, those. But for TAP, the TAP patients we usually take the small direct hernias and uh, if you have bilateral you can take it with tap also but the advantage of the tap is that you are visualizing the uh, you know the you know the abdominal cavity you are visualizing the other side without dissection while as in tap you have to dissect to see the other side of the inguinal region the second thing is that you can do a concurrent procedure in the tap you can do a cholecystectomy, you may do an appendicectomy, you can, you know, diagnose and, you know, survey the whole of the abdominal cavity. That is uh, the advantage of the tap, tap over the tap. But if you are, you know, at the beginning, you start with tap, you can then convert to tap because tap is considered even a, a difficult procedure. It has a more learning curve than the tap. So it is up to you, the which school of uh, learning uh, you are enrolled in you learn that and proceed with it now without creating a debate on that we take a patient but the general advice I should make it to all of you is that if you are if you are you know doing a tap procedure what patient should you select at the beginning if you are in your learning curve which patient should you select kindly understand that right-sided hernia should be taken at the beginning in the first stages a small hernia, irreducible and usually direct or small direct or a small indirect hernia on the right side. 
Left side you will feel difficulty in the beginning. You may take the left sided hernias later when you are better in your understanding, in your skill, in your experience of understanding this ailment. So that should be the kind of patient you start doing at the beginning of your training of uh, inguinal uh, laparoscopic management of inguinal hernias. And that's one. Now, let us say that we have selected a patient and now how are we going to prepare this patient and we are going to prepare him for a procedure called a TAP. So the first thing we do is we select this patient, we, we have to admit them, properly evaluate them. The important thing is that the pre-anesthetic checkup should uh, usually mention about the pulmonary function tests about these patients because most mostly these patients are elderly patients and uh, the causes, causes I am not going to talk about is usually uh, we have discussed in the last lecture and the hernia is in the we are taking uh, say the right inguinal hernia for a tap. Now how are we going to prepare this patient? The most important thing is that we should have a total checkup which will involve, involve the ECG, X-ray, pulmonary function tests, uh, his hemogram, his coagulation cascade and other things. Once we prepare this patient, we should ask the patient to make urine. If the patient you know, does uh, make urine, the bladder stays empty. And once the bladder is empty, what happens? Once the bladder is empty, it becomes easy for you to do a dissection. So, or if the patient is elderly, has uh, symptoms of uh, retention of urine or, uh, you, you know, benign hyperplasia prostate, then you better should, uh, you know, routinely catheterize these patients. So, we catheterize this patient, take him to theater, give a prophylactic intra-op antibiotic and then, you know, send him to the anesthetic team. The anesthetic team on table will evaluate, intubate the patient is usually done under general anesthesia and uh, uh, the patient should be put in a 30 degree Trendelenburg position, so head down position. Now is the first step is the trocar making. Now, how should we make the trocars? Where should the position? The first trocar is in the umbilicus. So, we do a varies technique usually. By varies technique, we introduce the pneumoperitoneum. The pressure should be kept to 15 millimeter mercury and around 2 to 3 liters are required to create this pressure. And once you have done the pneumoperitoneum, you put the first trocar. Once we get into the abdomen, we put an endoscope. Once the endoscope is put in, the position I said is 30 degree head down, the right side we are doing, so the right side is up, the surgeon comes on the left side of the, the monitor is on the foot end of the patient. So these are very important, you know, points which you need to understand that the surgeon in the right hernia comes on the left side, the monitor stays on the foot end. And not only that, the important is the positions of the trocar. So the surgeon, the, the cameraman, comes on the right of the surgeon. So, you have done the pneumoperitoneum, you have raised the, created the space, you have put the optical trocar, endoscope is put in, do a general survey of the abdomen. Once you do the general survey of the abdomen, what you do is that after the survey is done, you make, you know, uh, uh, you, you go to the other side, see the other side whether there is hernia. In 30 percent of the patients, it is, a, it's a, it is a published data that you may develop a contralateral hernia or there may be an occult hernia on the other side. So, you can easily, that is the beauty about the laparoscopy, that you move to the other side and you may do the second repair, the bilateral repair in the same city, through the same holes. You need not to make another incision, that is the beauty. So, what I am going to talk about is that once you get in and then you make two more trocars, five millimeter trocars, one is made in the just few centimeters, two or three centimeters right of the umbilicus and another we make three centimeters left of the umbilicus. And that is or else you can say in the line between the umbilicus and the anterior spirillic spine, in the line between the on the right side and in the same line uh, on the left side we make two trocars, taking care that we are not injuring the inferior epigastric artery. Friends, I know this is too much of a, a theoretical description of talking. You must be getting, uh, you know, getting confused that what I am talking about. Let us go and practically see as if we are visiting the theater and see how this procedure is being done. This is a video of tap. In my right hand is the harmonic. You are lifting it with the grasper. The peritoneum is lifted with the grasper 
and you can see that we are only holding the peritoneum in my uh, right hand, in the left hand is holding the peritoneum and the right hand is cauterizing with the harmonic. The important thing is that leave this fat, you see the yellow color, this yellow color is fat, we leave it down towards the abdomen and only hug the peritoneum. Now we are reaching at a place called as the internal ring. Now you see the fat at the internal ring is pushed up and we have gone beyond the inferior epigastric, inferior epigastric artery and the vein. This is at the ring I am dissecting. Now we are trying to create the medial space. Friends understand that this hernia is uh, on the left side. So this is a left sided hernia. Now what I am going to do is that I am holding the spermatic cord structures and I am cauterizing the, the layers of the spermatic cord. Now you can see that here we had an indirect hernia. Now in my left hand is the spermatic cord and I am trying to dissect it off from the, in my left hand is the sac, I am trying to dissect it from the spermatic cord. Now important is that you can see a structure called as a V, it forms a triangle. This is the triangle of doom. At the apex where I am dissecting is the ring. In my left hand, you have the vessels. On the right side, you have the vas. And down you have the peritoneum. Now you importantly have to maintain a very good hemostasis by pushing the structures of the cord down. Now you can hold this structure. This is sac. I am holding it with my left hand and trying to dissect it by right hand and separating this sac from the structures of the cord. You need to understand that the sac is anterolateral to the cord. So the dissection has to be very precise. Circumferentially you have to remove the sac from the spermatic cord structures and taking care that we do not injure the vas. Now you can see that we are cauterizing and removing this small sac and a pad of fat. Remove always this pad of fat because this could be a subsequent, you know, problems of lipoma this, uh, in this region could arise. So that is very important that once we remove this uh, structure called as sac, we can remove it later, keep it down somewhere and then go back to the area. Now you can see I am trying to make this is the lateral space. Please do not go more lateral, only see the source muscle can be seen here. I hope you can appreciate that there is a source muscle. If you see the pointer, that this is the upper fold of the peritoneum, this what I am holding, I am trying to create a space for the mesh. So before we put the mesh, this is the mesh that is designed 15 by 12 centimeter. There are many techniques of putting this mesh, but the one which we do not roll the mesh, you can roll it also, partly roll and partly not roll. But in the beginning, I think you should do that for the orientation. The mesh should not get curled, it should spread, you know, plainly all over the over all this area and that is very important that once you put this mesh, you have to understand that this mesh once put in, you have to not to curl it. Thus, there should be a proper space and the size is important 15 by 12 centimeters. I hope you can appreciate this picture. Can you appreciate? Yes. This is the mesh that has played over all the area. There is no wrinkle in the mesh. If it gets folded, the recurrence will occur. Patient will again come back with the recurrence. Now we are trying to see whether the lower fold can reach the upper fold. Friends, this is important step that we have to stitch back the two. I am using a V-law, a polydioxinone sodium suture, which is a, a barbed wire because this is, since the time is this suture has come up, life has become very comfortable for us because it's a barbed wire. There is a locking mechanism. Earlier days, I remember we used to take a lot of time. There is an eye there and we have, you know, fed this uh, thread through the eye of the uh, thread. A needle has been fed through the eye of the thread and then we are suturing. This is a very important, somebody telling me that you can do hernia without suturing, I, I should say no. You should not try it unless you learn suturing because I always keep on saying that uh, we should, we always know this, that suture is the future in laparoscopic surgery. So you have to get trained on the monitors for the, uh, you know, suturing and get trained, stay back with the monitors and learn this art of suturing because it will save the tackers. I, you must not have seen that, you must have seen that we have fixed this mesh at two places at the Cooper's ligament. We fix it, 
we do not fix the mesh down there uh, uh, medially because they are nervous. I have talked last time. We should not tag them there. And no tacker should be put in the triangle of doom or triangle of uh, trapezoid, uh, quadrangle of trapezoid. We should not tag them uh, medially also. And uh, every tag, if at all, should be done, should be above the iliopubic tract. Yes, this was a, a video demonstration of the transabdominal preperitoneal repair. I am sure you have watched this video and you have enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for watching this video. Now coming back to what I was talking uh, uh, before uh, the, the practical demand, I, I said that you need to understand that suture is the future. You have to learn the suturing. And should you start doing tap or tap, that is again a school of thought, what you believe in, what you are trained. But in tap, there are, I believe that it is, it is uh, it's more beneficial in a way that you can handle associated problems in the tap. Now looking at the tap, looking at its uh, implications, you can handle, you can do bilateral hernias in the same sting. You can handle any kind of hernias, even the sliding hernias, even the obstructed hernias, you can take them by tap. You can take bilateral hernias, but in bilateral hernias, you have to understand that the mesh should cross the midline and you should be tacked in the midline. So the dissection has to be carried on both sides, same dissection, and the mesh should overlap in the midline. That is very important. And one should tag the mesh in the midline uh, to, so that it will not you know, uh, overlap or it will not wrinkle or it will not fold. Now coming to uh, how the, once the procedure is complete, is seen, usually we do not put the drain. The hemostasis has to be made uh, sure and then the patient, the trochars have to be deflated, the pneumoperitoneum has to be deflated, we remove the trochars. And a very important point here, do not forget that, is that a scrotal you know, support is must because some amount of dissection is once we take, take the sac, if you have taken it whole sac out, there are more chances of developing a scrotal hematoma. So the scrotal support is a must and if you put the scrotal support, you uh, patient is catheterized, do a good dressing, you know, the strap dressing, compression on this inguinal area and then the patient will be extubated, he will be shifted to the post-operative, the recovery ward and usually within first 24 hours when we visit the patient in the morning in, on the rounds, we just see the bowel sounds are there and we usually remove the catheter on the first post-operative day. Oral SIPs can be started in the evening of the procedure or at the most uh, next day in the morning. And I believe that um, by the next day evening or, um, or at the most a day more, the patient can be discharged. But this patient should be seen in the first week and uh, the, the follow-up should be three weekly because the complications and the problems that can arise are usually arise in the first week, in the second week, the third week. Now, accept recurrence which can come later. Now, that was about the, uh, the patient who has been operated by a tap technique, has gone and is discharged. Now, what are the advices that you will give him at the discharge point? The advices you give him are say, as I said in the last lecture, the problem of hernia is raised intra-abdominal pressure. If he is a patient of prostate age, where he has BHP, he should concurrently go for, or he should, he should be taken for BHP surgery earlier than for hernia. So, so that is one. If he is a patient who has a chronic constipation, you have to deal with that, you have to treat his constipation. If he is a patient of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, he has to be treated for that. If he is a laborer, and has a very heavy and strenuous exercise of lifting heavy weights, you please advise him that do not lift heavy weights at least for three months. That's very important. And uh, do strenuous exercises uh, should not be done. Now, when should this patient return to normal activity? He returns to normal activity in the first week of his post-operative life. And he can do all the activities in by the first week. And that is the beauty about the minimal access laparoscopic surgery. Now we go back to, we go to the other aspect of this procedure. Now what are the problems that's very important because we always talk the green pastures. We always talk the good. We do not say what bad things can happen. And that's very important to know what bad things can happen in surgery. 
uh, a person, a surgeon who talks about complications is a true surgeon because if you know what complications can arise, you can treat them at the same time. Now, what are the problems, what are the complications that can arise into uh, this repair called as TAP? The first thing that can happen is intraoperative problems. Now, when you are making ports, the problems can arise from the ports, portal bleeding, you know, injury to the gut. But we are restricting it to the operative side. The concern problems could be you may injure the bowel, you may injure the bladder if you are not catheterized. Then what can happen after the procedure is done? Now what can happen after the procedure is done is that bleeding can occur. Bleeding is a very, very you know, important complication. And where from does this bleeding come? This bleeding can come either from the inferior epigastric artery or the vein or which can be controlled intraoperatively. But if the bleeding comes from the like veins and like artery, then one should really convert because that is disastrous. One should convert to open uh, technique and do it by open technique. Now, post-operative problems, what could they be? The first important problem that I should talk about is that we keep on seeing is seroma formation or hematoma formation. Now, why this seroma formation? If you are not doing a very accurate and precise dissection, seroma formation is there. Now, another cause of the seroma formation is that when you separate the sac from the pseudo sac, pseudo sac is part of the fascia transfer cells, sac is part of the peritoneum. What happens that in a direct sac, bigger direct sacs where there is bigger defects, there is more chance of developing a seroma formation or a hematoma formation. That is why some people will plug this or tack, you know, hold this uh, pseudo sac and, you know, tack it to the pubic uh, bone. Second to that is a urinary retention. Urinary retention is a very common uh, complication that can arise and for that, if you have not put a catheter, you need to put a catheter. It occurs around 1.3 to 5.8 percent. So, urinary retention can be another complication. The important complication that we see later is the neurology. So, if you are not understanding the anatomy, the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve, they are laterally on the sauce muscle and if you are tacking the tacks there, they can give neurologias and uh, neuropathies and paresthesias in this area. That could be another complication. Port site hernia is very common because you have a tenement port. It should be properly, you know, closed by a polypropylene, 2-0 polypropylene suture. And the important uh, and very disastrous complication is a mesh infection. Mesh infection has been seen that if you do not, you know, properly do proper aseptic techniques of putting the mesh into the abdomen uh, using separate, you know, different gloves, you are not touching the skin mesh with the skin, then uh, you will not develop mesh infection. But if mesh infection is there, that's very difficult to handle and it's a messy problem. You should not land into that. So take all the care that mesh should not get infection. Sometimes you may have to uh, remove the mesh or do an uh, next new repair for that. And the last but not the least is that these patients can develop recurrence and recurrence is to the tune of 1.5 to 1.8 percent by tap and in open technique you have around 25 percent of recurrence while as in tap technique you have a very low recurrence of around 2 percent and that's the beauty of doing a, a laparoscopic mesh neoplasty. So friends, I think it is, uh, uh, you are now totally exhausted. I believe that you have seen today the, uh, we have given the highlights of the anatomy, endoscopic anatomy, and we have uh, talked about the uh, videoscopic demonstration of transabdominal preperitoneal uh, repair of the mesh. Get ready, get tuned, learn suturing, learn the hernia repair, and be one among them, them who perform it. Thank you very much for today. It is enough. I take leave of you. Goodbye.